thousands of generations falling down in worship to sing the song of angels to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of angels to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above.
congregation, welcome to Cayman Islands Baptist Church. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. Church, do you believe that our God is alive? Do you believe that he is on the throne today? Holy forever, our God reigns. Let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. Oh God, holy God, you are king and you are on the throne this morning. And Lord, we thank you so much for this yet again another opportunity to gather as your people. Why? To give you praise and glory. To thank you, God, for dying on the cross for us. And to thank you, God, for what you did and for rising again. Lord, you will always be holy. No matter what men may say, you are holy. And Lord, we're here this morning. I pray, God, that you would open our hearts. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would speak to us. I pray, God, for Mr. Shane. God, I pray this morning that you would anoint him. Lord, that the words that come from his mouth are directly from you. I ask, God, that we would have open hearts. If we need to repent, I pray that you would help us to repent and to change and to be better for you. We thank you for what you will do in this service, God. Be pleased with our worship. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, congregation, we know many of you love a good Caribbean medley, and today we're going to sing one, but we want you to help us. We want you to not only sing, we want you to clap your hands. We want you to move a little bit. We want you to raise your hands and shout out that God, blessed be his name. Let's be united in this this morning. Yeah. 
Durante el transcurso del año 2023, nuestra Iglesia Bautista de Santo Suárez en Cuba se vio envuelta en un gran crecimiento y fortalecimiento que desafió las adversidades que enfrentamos como nación. Enfocados en el lema, hasta que todos lleguemos, dedicamos nuestros esfuerzos a impregnar cada fibra de nuestra congregación con el propósito sagrado de hacer discípulos tal como nos enseñó Cristo. Entre los diversos ministerios que cobraron vida con fervor, destacamos Conéctate, Misiones, Años Dorados, Benevolencia, Compañerismo Médico, Zacarías, Oración, Capacitación Bíblica, Deportivo, Infantil, Jóvenes, mujeres, hombres, matrimonios, adoración, teatro y comunicación. Dichos ministerios llevaron a cabo la misión y misión de la Iglesia por medio de programas mensuales y semanales en los que la Iglesia tuvo la oportunidad de participar íntegramente con corazones entregados y esforzados. Estos esfuerzos se reflejaron en algunos eventos
gestos conmovedores y significativos, como las misiones que abarcaron múltiples localidades del país, con seis grupos misioneros extendiendo la luz del Evangelio en el occidente de Cuba. Allí se compartieron ayudas en ámbito material y espiritual, se predicó a Cristo y se animó a la iglesia local a seguir adelante con la obra. De igual modo, resonó en alta voz la Escuela Bíblica de Verano, donde recibimos la increíble asistencia de 300 niños, 80 padres y más de 40 voluntarios, rompiendo nuestros récords para la gloria de Dios. Entre los proyectos que iluminaron nuestra labor comunitaria, resalta con esplendor el proyecto infantil Arbolitos de Fe, una guardería cristiana que acoge a los hijos de la iglesia y la comunidad, guiándolos en la senda de los principios bíblicos. Además, la siembra de iglesias emergió como una luz de esperanza, con dos nuevas congregaciones floreciendo, la Iglesia Bautista del Pedado y la Congregación del Auto. Esta última conciliada oficialmente como Iglesia de la Convención Bautista de Cuba Occidental en enero de 2024, llegando a un número de nueve iglesias plantadas en los últimos años. En esta lista añadimos por fe y por medio de la oración la nueva Iglesia del Sevillano, Viura. Como Iglesia Misionera nos regocijamos en el Señor en la obra que cada una de las iglesias hijas hacen para llevar adelante el Evangelio. Para este año 2024, nos centramos en la formación de grupos pequeños como parte integral de nuestra comunidad, a través de un número de 50 grupos pequeños que se han logrado establecer de manera exitosa, nos desafiamos a que cada uno de ellos se convierta en una iglesia en sí mismo, involucrándose activamente en las misiones, y compartiendo el mensaje de Jesús de forma natural en nuestra comunidad. ministry partners in Cuba, and this morning we're blessed to have Pastor Yosbani and his wife uh, Annabelle is here as well. Um, I'm going to ask Pastor Yosbani and, and Yoan come and, and, and help us translate a little bit. Um, to ask Pastor Yosbani just to share just a few minutes about the work that God is doing uh, in Cuba right now. Muchas gracias a todos por recibirnos. Many thanks to everybody for having us here. Es una gran bendición poder compartir con ustedes en esta mañana. It's a great blessing to be able to share with you in this morning. Decirles también gracias por acompañarnos todos estos años. Uh, we want to say thank you as well for being with us through all these years. Sin la oración de ustedes. Without your prayers. Sin el apoyo financiero. Without your financial support. No hubiésemos podido llegar tan lejos como el Señor nos ha permitido. We couldn't be so far in Christian ministry as the Lord has allowed us to be. Porque somos el cuerpo de Cristo. Because we are by Christ's body. Y nos necesitamos los unos a los otros. And we need from each other. En diez años Dios nos ha permitido. In ten years God has allowed us. Plantar más de ocho iglesias. To plant more than eight churches. Bautizar más de quinientas personas. To baptize more than five hundred people e impactar a muchas más iglesias en la ciudad de La Habana and to be a great impact to some more churches in Havana City nuestro país está pasando por duros cambios our country is experiencing great changes y creo que esta década será determinante and I think that this decade is going to be determined pero entendemos que Dios es el centro but we know that God is the center y Dios quiere usar a la iglesia en Cuba and God wants to use the church in Cuba en todo este proceso de transición que estamos como nación. in all this process of transition that we are having as a nation. Entendemos que el Evangelio debe de impactar la eternidad. Uh, we understand that the gospel should be impi- impactful for the eternity. Y quiero ilustrarlo con esta soga que he traído. And I want to uh, give you an illustration with this rope that I have brought. Porque esta es toda nuestra vida. Because this is all our life. 
Esta es nuestra vida presente hasta la muerte. This is our present life that we're living until death. Y el resto es la eternidad. And the rest will be eternity. Comparado la eternidad con el presente, el presente es nada. If you compare eternity with the present life, you'll see it's like nothing. Comparado con la gloria de Dios y su presencia en la eternidad, el presente no significa. If you if you look at God's glory and the and the eternity, the, the present life is nothing. It's Sin meaningless. Embargo, excuse me. Sin embargo, cuánto no nos desgastamos en esta vida. However, uh, how much effort we do in this life? Cuánto no luchamos por las cosas que no permanecen. How much do we fight for things that are meaningless? Cuánto estrés o ansiedad por lo que no puede prevalecer. How much stress and anxiety for things that will pass. La siguiente pregunta, ¿qué estamos haciendo para la eternidad? But now my next question will be, what are we doing for eternity? No podemos evitar llegar a la muerte, que es este nudo. Because we can avoid death, which is this knot. Pero sí podemos usar nuestra vida para la gloria de Dios. But we can use this, our life, for God's glory. Sí podemos hacer tesoros en los cielos. Yes, we can do treasures in heaven. Sí podemos cumplir lo que Mateo 6, 33 nos dice. Yes, we can accomplish what Matthew 6, 33 is saying to us. Buscar primeramente el reino de Dios y su justicia. Seed God's kingdom first and everything else will come. Y eso es lo que podemos hacer, iglesia. And that's what we can do, church. Todo lo que Dios nos ha dado. Everything that God has given to us. Es por Él. Is for Him. Y es para Él. And is for Him. So you are invited to participate with us. Cuba será un gran desafío. Cuba is going to be a great challenge. Pero una gran bendición para sus vidas. But a great blessing for your life. Recuerda esto. Remember this. No is about you. It's not about me. It's about him. God bless you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Yosvani and, and Yoan for helping us uh, translate there. Um, Pastor Yosvani, we, we will commit to continue to praying for you, praying for your church and the work that God is doing through you uh, and your family in Cuba. Uh, it, we can't wait to come visit. Um, so well, I'm, I'm sure we'll be doing that soon. Um, as the ushers come forward this morning, just a couple of announcements. An update on Pastor Randy, as everybody's asking. Um, he continues to heal at home uh, in Alabama with his family. Um, he would admit that it's probably taken a little more, a little longer than he would have liked, but, um, but uh, he's doing well and continuing to heal at home. Um, our Wednesday worship night and, and our Friday night events will we'll, uh, get back going this week after a couple of weeks off. Um, and then lastly, these beautiful flowers that match everything so perfectly um, are given in, in memory of um, Miss Virginia Castillo. And I know all of her family is, is here this morning, a whole bunch of them. And um, many of you remember Miss Virginia as kind of a, a church mom. Um, and she was involved and had her hand in everything here um, that, that happened at Cayman Islands Baptist Church. And so she's deeply missed um, but these beautiful flowers today are giving, given in her memory um, by her family. Um, would you pray with me? Yeah, clap, clap before we pray. Clap for Miss Virginia. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we come this morning with grateful hearts. We have so much to be thankful for, Lord, so much that you have done and you are doing, and we know that you will continue to do, Lord. We, we lift up Pastor Yosfani. Uh, and the work being done in Cuba, Lord, we, we would pray that you would just uh, revolutionize that country um, by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, and here in our, our own church, on our own, our own island, God, would you make yourself known? Would you make yourself present this morning? Lord, may the gifts that we give and, and may our lives, our very lives be given in honor and service to you. Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus. We ask all of this in his name, amen.
Good morning. Um, I was just sitting there thinking uh, how much of a blessing it is to hear what's been going on in Cuba and throughout history. Hard times, persecution has caused the church to expand and explode, and the gospel to reach many people. And we just praise God for that. So take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Beginnings. The book of Origins, and that's the book of Genesis. We're going to be in chapter 1, verses 24 to 28, mainly. And as we continue this, what we believe series, we're here at the doctrine of man, creation, and fall. So as we go through this series, one of the one things I want us to remember and to drive home in our minds is that doctrine matters. What we believe matters. More specifically in regards to our faith, what we believe about our faith matters. Sincerity is one thing, being sincere, sure, but in the essential truths of our faith, we do not want to be found sincerely wrong. Amen? Believing a lie. So this is day number six, and I'll read and you can follow. Verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. Then it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image, his own image. 
In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we come to your word, as we come to hear from you, I just pray that you have your way. You plant your word in our hearts and you bring glory to your name. All for the sake of Christ and for our good. And in his name we pray, amen. So I'm of the belief, being convinced by scripture, that the book of Genesis is not up for debate or interpretation. It is foundational. It is the historical account given by God through the prophet Moses for God's people to know and not to guess on the things found in its pages. And here in the Doctrine of Man, the Bible gives historically clear teachings on our creation and purpose, our agency, and as we're going to see later on, our fallen, self-inflicted demise. And here, though not an exhaustive study on this topic, we're going to search and see who we are, who he says we are, And so as I speak, I ask you, please, please, be like the Bereans who received the word with all eagerness, but also examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Because I don't want you to be convinced by what I say. I want the Bible to convince you. The late R.C. Sproul once said, How we understand humanity in large measure controls how we treat human beings, how we value human beings. Any Christian life and worldview must include within it a Christian anthropology, a Christian understanding of what it means to be human, one that answers the fundamental questions that we have. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? What is my purpose? And where is my life headed? Where better to go than the God of all creation? And so verse 6, he says, Let us make man in our own image, after our likeness. Here at this point, when God says, let us make man, we get an insider view, so to speak, of the disclosure between the divine counsel before the creation of man. The us there being the Trinitarian counsel, Father, Son, and Spirit. It is the same words used in Genesis 11:7, when God said, let us go down to confuse their language at the time of Babel. So it is undeniable that man was created different from the animals. He had the breath of life breathed into him. The animals did not. And so my next point is very obvious, both Christian and non-Christian here today. You are not the distant cousin twice removed from a chimp. Good. Following. Good talk. Man was created in the image of God. This means that man has moral and intellectual abilities similar to God, as well as reflects some of his attributes, though not as perfect and vast. We think about compassion. We think about love. We think about mercy. But we are not God that we can declare anything and make it. We are also not ones that can breathe life into anything. That's attributes reserved for the creator himself. Those are the ones he has not shared with us. So when God makes man, he breaks the pattern that he has set by creating living things according to their kinds. We see that here. The repetition of this causes us to anticipate it with every new creature being made. But... There's something very, very, very different happening here at this point. Man is not created after any other kind. He's not made according to his kind. No. Man is created after God's kind, in his image and likeness. The reason is we do not belong to their kinds. Whatever similarities there are between us and other creatures. So to put it in modern scientific language, For a scientist in here, man is not a particular species within a given genus of living creatures. 
Man is unlike any of the living creatures. That's verse 26. Man is made according to God's kind. Made in the image of God, the imago Dei. Man, like God, is a personal being. Human persons are, create, are created beings for sure, so in that regard, there are similarities and characteristics we share with other created beings. But what is most important about us is that we are made after the image and likeness of God himself. This doesn't mean, though, because I have to say it, that we are little gods, as taught by a lot of false teachers on the Trash and Blasphemy Network, like TVN. You got your Creflo Dollar and your Joel Osteens, and you got your Stephen Furtick who teach this. It's not the case. So we control all and delete that. Rather, bearing the image of God, we as humans are giving a measure of sovereignty over all the earth, with dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the livestock, every creeping thing that, like it says in verse 28, the language here suggests a ruling and a type of conquering as God, with God as God's vice regents. So when you see me randomly trying to swat and play tennis with a fly, just let me exercise my dominion. <laughs> Roaches and mosquitoes can get it too. Here it says in Psalms 8, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Verse 3, when I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have made and set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all the sheep and the oxen, the beast of the field, and you get the picture. All things were placed under God's, under man's feet. All things except God himself. And tyranny and exploitation are not in view here, no. It's clear that in Genesis 2, 4 to 25, God shows that man is to follow his example as stewards of the earth, to take care of it, because we were made stewards. God plants a garden in Eden, and he puts the man there to work it and keep it. Chapter 2. What God initiates, he puts man to sustain and cultivate. God names the light day and the darkness night, etc. And then he commissions Adam to name all of the animals. So quick point here. Does this sound like a mindless primitive descendant of a primate incapable of rational thought or does this being show superior intelligence with meticulous rationale and intention modeling after his creator? We can answer that later. So could we stop teaching our kids and accepting, quite bluntly, the doctrine of demons, more specifically Darwinian evolution that says we are just that, mindless beings, product of random chance? It not only dehumanizes us, but it also makes God out to be a liar. It's funny how the people that say they excel in all knowledge are the ones lacking it. Yet the Bible says, fool says in his heart there is no God. If racism and classism we won't let slide, why do we allow evolutionistic planet of the apes type theology to slide? We are not cosmic accidents, devoid of ultimate value. Me mechanistic determinists and hyper-evolutionists say, quote, Human, the human animal is the highest advance up the scale of life that emerges out of primordial slime. Are you slime? Humanity, the grown-up germ, is the result of accidental cosmic forces. And the destiny of the human race is at the mercy of these indifferent forces. Impersonal forces. That's interesting. It's also garbage and pseudoscience. God dismantles evolution in one verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Time, space, matter, the end. And the, evolutionist, the evolutionistic religion, that's it, because that's exactly what it is, only became popular in the 1800s 
They argue that it is scientific reality. It is not. It's just a belief about the past. And therefore, Christians must accept it. Not this one, friend. Why? We shouldn't allow the words of fallible humans to determine truth. Truth. We must go back to God's word and ask the question, does scripture even allow for evolution? And none, I repeat, none, zero of the biblical writers believed or even taught it. The mechanistic view offers no understanding of the meaning and intrinsic value and sanctity of life. There has been this attempt to, um, in the ra radically changing worldview of atheism, to try and fit in a type of moralistic ethic. But all have failed. Why? Because you have to steal from Christianity to make your worldview attempt to make sense. Why should a germ be moral? If I am a cosmic accident, why should I care about you or my children? Why should I care about life? Why should I care about death? Why should you be valued over a stone or a stray animal? It's because of this verse. God made us in his image and his likeness. Furthermore, and I dare even to say the most important is if Adam and Eve, the fall, the entire Genesis account aren't real or historical, then Jesus died for a mythological problem. And that would make him a mythological savior, offering us a mythological hope. I cringe at that because it is blasphemy and a lie. There is a reason why there's a constant fight to destroy the biblical truth of Genesis and the origin of all things, as well as God who made it. And who might I ask, do you think, would want something like that to happen? The devil. Same thing in the Garden of Eden. Christianity teaches that human dignity, value, worth, etc. is rooted in the holiness of God and who God is. Let us make man in our own image and likeness. It reflects God's dignity. We bear his image. Both men and women are of equal value, though both have different God-given roles. That says a lot to the feminists. This fundamentally foundational truth is one of the major reasons why abortion is wrong. It's not the murder of some thing, it's the murder of someone. Psalms 139. For you formed, me, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. Why? Because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And why am I emphasizing this so much? Is because in this day and age, we live in a world where just me saying that verse would get me labeled an unloving bigot. And then you have me all over my road next. I welcome the smoke. God is king, and he says, he created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then what did he do? Verse 28, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This is fleshed out even more in Genesis 2, 18 to 25. Then the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. 19 to 20, God brings all the animals to Adam and then Adam starts to name all of them. So you can imagine him like, that's a she-goat, that's a he-goat, that's a donkey, male donkey, female donkey. And he's like, so how come everything has a she? So for him, he, you can imagine how he is feeling. So what did God do for him? God put him to sleep. Not just any sleep, a deep one. And he took a rib. And hear this, specifically women, hear this. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made. That word? It gives a note of being built, being fashioned. You hear that? You were fashioned, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. 
So dismiss what TikTok and everything says about you, please and thanks. And he, he formed the woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, Yes, Lord, a fimi daughter, this, and my wife. Eh? Oh, yeah. That was the Jamaican translation, by the way. Um, the ESV translation says, This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Why? Because she was taken out of man. Do you notice that the biblical order of things is a blessing and part of worship? It's because that's how God has it. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and will fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Here is God's good design. Marriage, not something man-made, which means do not touch it. God is creator, and he blesses man, his crown creation, made in his image and likeness, to do the very same thing he did. With the marriage union, he gave the ability to fill the earth and subdue it with more image bearers to have babies. And again, this day and age, women, only women, okay? Gender is binary. And bearing children is exclusively for women. Moving on. <laughs> this was bliss, 100% bliss. For those of us who worship and feel like utter garbage when we come through the door on a Sunday, because we do, even though I'm fine. No, you're not. You feel like trash. I understand. So let's talk about what truth is, because that's the joy that lasts, right? For Adam and Eve, they had perfect union with God. They were at the pinnacle of worship. They had unhindered access to God. This is exemplified in the account in Genesis 3.8, where God, God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. How much we long for God's presence when we worship. They had it. Eden was God's temple where heaven and earth converged. Sin never, ever disrupted worship. The psalmist says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And for Adam and Eve, this is literally all they knew. Westminster Confession of Faith says, For Adam and Eve, the law of God was written in their hearts. They were without sin, unquote, endued with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness after God's own image, with the ability to keep God's law. And then, one rule, given specifically to Adam. We men, we mess up a lot of things. Genesis 2, 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree, every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And that's exactly what happened. In Genesis 3, they decided to reject God's word and eat from the tree. Well, you may think to yourself, well, they didn't die immediately. Yes, they did, because see, God is the author and giver of life. So to be separated from him by default makes you dead. Though this wasn't a bodily death yet, immediately it was a spiritual one. There is also an eternal one to come. So where does this leave us as Adam's children, descendants of Adam? The Bible has an answer for that as well. Cue the total depravity of man the doctrine the world hates, the doctrine of original sin. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 5. See, Adam was the federal head or representative in the Garden of Eden. Therefore, as 1 Corinthians 15.22 says, in Adam all die. And this is a result this is the result, a transmission of the sin nature to all of his descendants. Psalm 51, 5. The word there is imputation. That's a beautiful word. Remember it, okay? I'll come back to it later. Creation also fell. We see that, fell, we see that in Genesis 3, Romans 8. They became unable to do God's will. That's in Romans 6 and 7. 
they, came, they became subject to the curse of the law and death as stated in Deuteronomy 27 and Romans 6. And they became unfit for God's presence. Isaiah 59 too. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. Psalms 5. But you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. See friends, we aren't just sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. The Bible teaches that outside of Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sins and alienated from God. And we need to be made alive. And we can't do this ourselves. That we are slaves to sin, rebellious and haters of God. Ephesians 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Even Jesus said the same and taught the same. As you remember when he was calling his disciples in Matthew 8. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus' reply to him was, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. There's so many more I can give you. So many more. God also says to us in his word that it is impossible for us to come to Christ on our own accord. To free ourselves from both the consequences and bondage of sin and death. That is why we are so desperately in need of his grace. Think of these verses with me. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. That was Jesus. John 6. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. Verse 13 in John. Who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Jesus tells Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that you must be born again. Must be. He furthermore exposes in Romans 3, as it is written, no one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. So as a side note, you can't seek for God until he found you. Just ask Lazarus and the Apostle Paul. Because why? Why do we love? The Bible says we love because he first loved us. Let's continue. Verse 12. And all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So dare us not say, if I was in the garden, I would have fill in a blank. I can't believe he did that. She listened to that snake. If you were there, you're going to do the exact same thing. Have we not spent from Adam and Eve to this present day doing exactly what they did? Hiding our sin and blame shifting. Eve blamed the serpent and Adam had the gall to blame God. The woman you gave me made me eat. We excuse our sins and point the finger at God like he's the problem for sin and evil and brokenness that has permeated through the annals of history to this day. We too, like Adam and Eve, exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the, the creature rather than the creator who is forever blessed. Seeking to be our own God and seeking to keep the one and, one and true only God from his throne. Why? Because we don't want his rule, if we're honest. That's the same lie in the Garden of Eden. God is hiding something from you. He knows that when you eat, you will have. And since they did not see it fit, hear that. And since they did not see fit, don't blame the devil for everything. To acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, 
murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Which of us can escape this indictment? And I know it's heavy. I had to prepare it for today. This hit so close to home, you would think that it was written yesterday based on the survey of what's happening in our, in, in our, our society. This hits too familiar to present day. Hear this though. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of his heart was only evil continually. Every only continually. Sounds like present day, right? That was before the flood. What the entirety of mankind must understand is we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We transgress God's law. We haven't just simply done bad things or messed up. We've continually committed cosmic treason against the holy, holy, holy and just God. And there's a price to pay. Romans 6, 23 tells us that. God's wrath and he will not excuse sin. We must all come to the reality of our sin like David did in Psalms 51. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Can you say that today? Is the Lord convicting you of anything? That's good. Why is it good? Jesus. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's our Savior. You see, why is the, God, why is the doctrine that the world hates? Because it exposes the true nature of our hearts. It strips us of all of our weapons that we would use to justify ourselves and leaves us barren and naked before God. The neglect of, the, of what the Bible teaches about the total depravity of man has led to two things. One, a man-centered false, go false gospel that can't save and robs God of his glory. It essentially tells you that you are not all that bad and you have a hand in your salvation, so kudos to you. In a close second, it has also led to many false converts and cults. That's why Seventh-day Adventism and the false prophetess Ellen G. White are wrong. You are not good and you cannot make yourself righteous. Here are Jesus' words. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Why? because I testify about it that it works are evil. What is the heart of the problem in society? The hearts of the people in society. That's the problem. Jesus says, what comes out of a mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander, Matthew 15. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jeremiah. Who can say I have made my heart pure and I am clean from my sin? Proverbs 20. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or leopard his spots? Then also you can do good who are evil. That's rhetorical. That's Jeremiah 13. Jesus is the only one who can raise dead people back to life. The only one who can save sinners. The only hope for any person in here and abroad. The phrase in Adam indicates our relationship to Adam and our relation to him. That he represented us in the garden. In the same way for those of us who are Christians here today, Jesus represented us on the cross. Romans 5, 6, 8, 1 Corinthians 1, 15, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. I can go on. This is why the gospel is such good news news of great mercy and grace like the hymn writer says tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word 
And I thought of Miss Amiko when I wrote this part. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that what? Saved a wretch like me, not a good person. Not a good person. The gospel will never be good news to you if you think you're good enough to earn Jesus' favor. That's essentially saying that his sacrifice is not enough for you. It's Christ alone. Trust in him alone. Shortly we'll be partaking in communion. And you remember that word I told you, imputation? How Adam's sin was imputed to us. For those of us who are believers in Jesus, the beautiful thing about imputation is the righteousness we do not have by faith Jesus gives us as a gift. He imputes his righteousness to us to be received by faith. That is the good news of the gospel. That's a promise. So in closing, and you can bow your heads with me. As you hear that, brothers and sisters who are Christians here today, let the blessed hope of the gospel be your anchor. And if you're not a Christian, I pray that you would come. Put down your arms and come to Jesus. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, what did he do? He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Shane. Friends, we are created in the image of God, yet fallen and, and sinful. But by the grace of God and through the blood of Jesus, we are invited to this table as children of God, as family members. And so as those that are, are helping serve come forward, um, you are invited you're invited to, to a meal, a feast, to remember what Jesus has done for you, but also in preparation for the eternal glorious feast that we'll, we'll share together with the Creator, with our Creator. This is an open table. If you are a follower of Jesus this morning, if you're a Christian, would you come and, and take and, and taste and see that Jesus is good? If you're not a Christian this morning, I would love the opportunity to speak with you after the service about what we believe about this table, about what this represents to us. So as the music plays, um, downstairs, if you'll make your way towards the center aisle and then go back out towards the outside, there's also elements up in the balcony. Uh, as the music plays, would you come, come to the Lord's table. This is a table prepared for you to remember Jesus' sacrifice for you. Would you come? Would you come? As you make your way forward and get the crackers and the juice, you can, you can go back to your seat and we'll partake together. Feast on Jesus. Taste and see that the Lord is good.
I was praying for loaves and fishes to be multiplied as we got to the end there, with just a couple left. But praise the Lord for that. On the night that, that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his followers, his disciples, in a, in a room. And they shared a meal together. And he said, this is my body. And it's broken for you. And he took the bread and he blessed it. And they ate together. And he said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he says, this is my blood shed for you as often as you drink this. Do this in remembrance of me. Church, we are created in the image of God, but we couldn't do it on our own and we couldn't save ourselves. And so God loved us enough to send his son, Jesus, to die in our place. May we worship him today and forever. Let's pray. God, we thank you for an opportunity to gather in your house, Lord. Wretched sinners, Yet, we are able to be credited with your righteousness because of your willingness to sacrifice and die for us on the cross. And we are eternally grateful for that. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your mercy and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, the Lord in His wonderful grace, and the things of earth will go strangely in, in the light of His glory and grace. May God bless you. You are dismissed.